creative crux of the seminar. Now, mind you, this isn't, this doesn't have to be everyone's project. Okay, there, well, there's, there's lots of lots of related things one can do, and as you see, this is going to get into other issues, including maximum likelihood estimation. Okay, it's a multi-dimensional. So what I mean by multi-dimensional, well, let's take what we know about IRT, item response theory. Okay, so I'm just going to put axes down for the simple thing for IRT. So two dimensions. So we have our aptitude theta parameter going this way, and we have our projected score. Call it E, so expected or projected score E going up to 100%. Okay. All right, so this, these are the two dimensions in which uh, IRT models operate, but in my case, there's a lot of complication. Okay. Now, the first thing is that we want to get more out of the projections. Okay. So what we want, we want to project P1, which is the probability of the unique right answer. Okay. And um, I don't know. I told you about round brackets and square brackets. Okay, round brackets, the square brackets have a Boolean predicate inside. Round brackets are an argument to a distribution. Uh, so I could say I'm defining the distribution directly on the answer, but I want you to think of it instead as the probability of the event that a responder gives the unique right answer. Okay, and this, corresponds to the move match MM probability. Okay. So we want to um, so we want to project that. Okay. Then there's something else which um, I'll call PEV is the probability of giving an equal top or equal optimal value answer. Okay. Now this isn't yet getting into partial credit. This is just reflecting the reality that sometimes on some questions the professor might consider multiple answers to be reasonable and not require you to give all of them, giving just one of them is acceptable. You know, for instance, I, I probably would have uh, graded the Panama hat question that way. Okay. Because um, it's not no longer clear that Ecuador makes, uh, makes a, a, a lot or a majority of, of Panama hats. Okay, so now this corresponds to my equal value measure. Okay. Okay. And um, so this was, by the way, may I will, let me set up the projector just in case I want it. Okay. Not necessarily. So I got to do and then get to this. Okay. All right. Now, the third thing, though, 
is we want our expected score. So when partial credits are given. So this is, by the way, it's just on, on one question, but what's a little bit confusing is the fact that um, is the fact that we can think of uh, multiple moves. So what's a little bit um, confusing, as I covered last time, is the fact that there are multiple trials. So it could so, we, so this could be referring to expected score over a whole bunch of moves, but that's actually not what I mean. Expected score or expected loss. Okay, expected loss of points on one item. But we are then going to average loss. Okay. But then we will average these over multiple items, e.g. 100 question exams or 200 plus moves in a tournament. Okay. We're just talking about the expected loss of points on one item when you have partial credits. And in the chess case, or in chess in particular, And by cheating tests. Okay, so this corresponds to my scale difference. SD metric. Okay. And you may remember that this is the sum over J equals 1 to L, the number of legal moves, the probability of move J times the loss or difference VJ from V1. Maybe it's nicer if I put V1 and VJ in that order. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the point where I have some metric delta for that. Okay. And then I'll call this ASD when averaged per move. So these, MM, EV, those three are the main cheating tests that whose statistics you saw at the end of my last presentation. But they're stated in neutral terms, um, coming from exams. Okay. And I used to just emphasize these two. These used to be my main ones. This one I added after uh, a paper written by a few other people four years ago uh, recommended using it. So I include it now. Um, equal top value measure. Okay. But more to the point, what is informing all of these, and as you can see, certainly necessary to define this one, is that we want to project probabilities P 
pj, or p of mj, is the probability of mj for all legal moves, mj, not just m1. Okay. So that's what we want. So this is our polytomus. with partial credits idea, which sounds like a mouthful in terms of the simpler forms of item response theory. But all that really means is that we're doing predictive analytics. Okay. So, to me, I'm, I'm, I'm using that as my definition of predictive analytics. You're into predictive analytics when you're designing a model that puts probabilities on all the events, at least all the relevant events, not just the best event or the particular event you're concerned with. Okay? All right, so that's, so this in blue. So basically, what I'm writing in blue is a complication of everything in green. Okay. Um, so now, if we want probabilities of all the moves, we have another dimension coming off here. Okay. And what this dimension is, this is a quality or rank of the move we wish to project. Okay, so now if I'm right on this axis, axis where I want the expected score, and especially if I'm in the simpler case where I have unique right answers and projecting their probabilities is equivalent to projecting the score, then that's my P1 right here. But now I've got the second best move the third best move, if I'm thinking of it in rank terms, okay, so the probability of a blunder might be down here. Okay, we want to project all of those probabilities. And to make things even more, basically anything in red is going to be things that's particularly problematic. So is it quality or rank that we want? If it's rank, then, you know, rank one, two, three, best move. This is some here around L equal 35, typically. Average number of legal moves in a chess position. Actually, that can be a warm-up exercise from my data, what it is, and I forget what the result was. But uh, traditionally, it's somewhere between 35 and 40 legal moves in a chess position. But the other measure that you might want to have is this delta V1 DI value. Okay. So, you might, so that axis might be an axis of drop off in value. For instance, you might be in a chess position where there's only one move to stay in the game, everything else is a blunder. So if you play the second best move, oh yay, it looks like you play the second best move. But, so it would be up here. But in terms of the difference in value, it really should be thought of as belonging down there along that axis. Okay, so that's actually already the, the key problem um, for us to focus on in relation to what we saw with item response theory. Because what we saw is, well, for the probability of the best answer, there is good um, scientific theoretical as well as uh, data confirming evidence that the shape of the curve that we want to graph on this green part of it, our nice simple green screen, is a logistic curve with the three characteristics that we uh, talked about. Okay, namely the guessability, as this here, 
the distance from left to right being the difficulty, and then the discrimination being how steeply sloped it is, especially at its inflection point and its symmetry point. Okay. But when we go to these other portions of this axis, and I don't, can't really draw it on the blackboard, except imagine it's coming out of the screen, we have curves like that, we have curves like that, we don't know where they are, we don't know what function should be used to estimate them, we're at a complete loss. Things get incredibly complicated, and I'm not just saying that they're complicated for our little seminar among first and second year graduate students at the University of Buffalo. As far as I see, from looking for a reasonable survey, I don't think they're resolved in the entire IRT community. But, but the, there's some general idea of what the shapes of curves could be, but it may be an outcome of this seminar that we give some guidance and criticism uh, or, uh, on, what, on whether, for instance, the curves for intermediate answers really should be bell curves, as the web page that I uh, showed suggests. Okay. Um, all right. So that's, uh, so I'm going to elaborate on that, but before I elaborate on that, I want to show you two other complicating factors, okay? And those come from the nature of the inputs that we're getting, and also break down on the nature of, of, of what kind of aptitudes we're going for. Okay, so now, um, so I'm going to... Um, First, write down a few more axioms of the model. Okay. And the basic idea is that my model is founded on axioms, every one of which is probably false, but that collectively seem to be working fine. The independence, false technically, but we can adjust it and uh, seems to be working well. Um, okay, so this is the main principle. Okay. okay, so the probability of a move Okay, so probability and I'm going to use the general capital letter Z Okay, so Z is going to stand for I could also use P or S C H Okay so this represents player parameters. Okay. So this is a formal player. Okay. So, and I use that, you'll see I use that term in the uh, paper that I gave out on Wednesday. So by the way, one of the things this presentation is supposed to do is help you penetrate the uh, the paper I gave you on Wednesday. If you looked at it, great, that uh, skim would be good, but it's really for then trying to grapple with over the weekend. Okay, so the probability PRZ of a move MJ as a function of the formal parameters or player parameters depends chiefly on the value vj or vj equals v of mj of mj in relation to the values of the other option. <laughs> That's the main statistical principle of the model. Okay. And you may have seen that if you read my Fidelity webpage, it appears in bold green. <laughs> probability of a move, uh, you know, given a certain player that you're testing. The probability of making a move uh, to, under, under the null hypothesis of fair play by that particular player. Probability of making a move depends on its value 
in relation to the values of the other moves. Okay. So let me just say a little bit about the value. I put this in green. I could put this in red. And one of you for a project may take issue with my comfort on this, uh, on this issue. And I'm about to anyway complicate this myself. That's when I'll use blue. But I'll go with green here. So this is the objectively measured measured hindsight or authoritative value given by chess programs at, well, you know what, I am going to write this word in red. So, so I'm telling you that there's lots of things that are floating around and undetermined, but I'm claiming that I can authoritatively and objectively measure the values of the moves. The programs change their mind, and in fact, I was rushing. I didn't manage to finish the post before the class, but I'm about to make a post on the Girdle's Lost Letter blog. I'll, I'll so, you know, post on Piazza when it's ready. Uh, a case of really wild deviations in measurements by different chess programs on what ought to be a dead simple eight-piece position, eight-piece endgame. Okay, if I have time, I'll show that at the end. But for the most part, the values are, are pretty close to each other. They're, uh, they're interchangeable. Um, okay. So anyway, so objectively measured value given by chess programs at sufficiently high depths. Okay. Now, um, okay, so that's the that's the uh, main principle of the model, and it's gonna. So the general idea: what does it mean to depend in relation to the values of other moves? Let's say you have the optimal move, whatever that is. Okay, and. Suppose there are three other moves that are very close to it in value. Then I will, my model should give results that give each move a probability in the neighborhood of one quarter. Or at least give each of those moves a pretty equal value. Okay. So in particular, this has um, one consequence. Okay, so for any fixed Z, okay, and by the way, I meant to write in, in black that we could simplify Z, well, Z actually, no, I, I, yeah, I'll say Z can simplify to the ELO rating And e, if you, e is what we're going to use as the theta in chess. Okay. By the way, for any fixed z or any fixed elo level e, for any fixed, okay, if we if we are treating players of the same rating all alike, okay. If the value of mi equals the value of mj, okay, so whatever the value of m1 is, then the probability of mi should equal the probability of mj. So that's the most basic axiom you can imagine. Okay. And you can take it as a notion of agnosticism. Okay. So I'm going to write underneath 
the agnostic principle okay so the values of the moves the values vjt move mjt at each game turn t are the only game uh, specific data given to the So I call this my agnostic principle. Okay. So hence, the same model should work for Go, Shogi, other games. Examinations. Okay. So that's my agnostic principle. I said the only element of chess that I want to use is the values of the moves given by computer programs, thus making the issue how good people or people working with a complex problem under bounded rationality are able to sniff out those objective values of the moves based on their raw ability, based on their chess knowledge, based on their experience, based on their studies. And similar principle in regard to examinations. Stated like that, okay, so stated like that, so if I adopt this as an axiom, then it seems to imply the main principle. I mean, ipso facto, if, I'm only, if the only data I'm giving the model are the parameters and the values of the moves, then any output of the model, which is supposed to be the probabilities of the moves, can only depend on what it's given. <laughs> so it depends chiefly on the value of the move uh, in relation to the values of the other moves, okay? So if I adopt this agnostic principle, then this is a tautology. Okay? Yeah, so that's a tautology, all right? And it is a basic principle of logic that uh, when you have an axiom and you have a consequence such that the implication follows by a mathematical proof, meaning that the implication is a logical tautology, and then you have something further derived from that consequence, namely numerically if this is true then this is true, then by the rules of mathematics, what you get at the end of your derivation must be true. But, okay, this is false. Okay. Well, this is empirically false. Yeah, let me put that. Show you that it's uh, that it's false. So this is this is uh, 
one of the big shocks. There's actually a very simple computer science reason why it's false. It has to do with the nature of chess programs okay, and how they operate. In other words, it's false for a systematic reason having to do with the way the data is gathered. There is a bias in the data. And part of the issue of what I'm dealing with is whether I want to regard that bias as a feature or as a scourge. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So there's, so there's data bias. And a too narrow principle. So now, in blue pen, okay, I have room to write the continuation of this sentence at or over various depths of search. Now, if I add this to my model, okay. then I'm going to be immune to this falseness. Okay. So this can but this now. What this means though is that now values is not just referring to the fact that there are multiple moves. Values is now referring to the fact that there are multiple depths of search. And that's the difference between the big matrix of numbers that I showed you in my newer data versus the idea of simply having a set of numbers for each move. Okay. So that's the, uh, by the way, okay. So that's part of the, uh, that's a second dimension of what's going on. Okay. Now, I have to put another axis on. And for that purpose, I'm actually going. Well, I, I'll, I'll leave the uh, I'll leave the green curve up, and I'll put as a little note. This assumes that different test items are alike. Okay. So now. I'll put out one more axiom over here. So this is the large data assumption. Okay. So with enough data points, okay, in homogeneities. is going to bring me to my next axis, and this axis is going this way, okay, and this is that move profiles, or test item, okay, or move, or position, Profiles are different widely. We can say R in homogeneous. Okay. So, if I want to project statistics on an exam, then as we saw, you might have a reason to want to use all questions of a, sim of a single type and also make the nature of those questions fairly consistent in difficulty and the types of different answers that are included. Or you could have a test where every uh, question is a true-false question and you give 200 true-false true, true -false questions. Those are pretty 
um, pretty homogeneous. But chess is not homogeneous. Some positions are like true-false questions. Are you going to find the move you need or not? Other positions have a wide range of strategies where there's a lot of intrinsic value in a lot of moves. Okay. So that's, those are positions where you really should get partial credit for moves other than the computer's moves. Okay. So now, um, I'm not sure, I, 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 I don't, one of the little things is I don't know whether to use the word profile to mean the parameters of the players, but I've gotten in the habit of using profile to mean the shape of a move, um, or a little bit more than that. So I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to um, uh, get in trouble here. Okay. So the way I've modeled this in my chess model is that it's a tuple. So black, by the way, black is referring to things that are are sort of were given as the nature of the model. So this is the old or the original style, using one high depth only. So what you're given is a tuple, and the tuple has uh, delta 1 equals 0, and delta 2, delta 3, delta 4, and so on up to delta and then we could also include V1. So what are these deltas? Um, delta I <coughs> is just standing for delta of VI from V1. And it's the difference in value of the moves. So by the main principle, I'm just taking that difference of being in its value, of the difference in values, and it's also equal to just V1 minus VI unscaled. But as we saw, I actually scaled them. So I'm writing that more generally. So those are my tuple of deltas of move values. And then there's the uh, value of the best move itself. Okay, so that's the profile of a move. Okay. So some things about these profiles. Okay, so if delta 2 is high, the profile says is one clear cut answer. Okay. So if delta 2, delta 3, and delta 4 are tiny, then you have a case of many good options. And there are many more of these uh, shapes of different profiles. Okay. So now this is a, uh, a major issue. And so one fact to look for, okay, so I'll put it up, I'll, I'll write this for, for reasons of space, I'll write this on the bottom of the board. Okay. So one theorem in my um, psychometrics paper proves that if the profiles of all moves are the same, Genius. Then my percentile fitting method <coughs> which I later abandoned percentile fitting method always gives the same projections Projections as MLE. Okay, that's 
maximum likelihood estimation. And that's going to be maximum likelihood estimation is what I'm going to get into next week. Okay? But false with inhomogeneity. So that was a little bit of a disappointment. But, this was especially when I was using the percentile fitting method, um, at that time, um, I thought that the large data assumption might fix. I have enough data, you know, the jumbles of moves of every kind, but I've got thousands of moves, then maybe I can average over them, and that will give me a fairly homogeneous picture. Okay. So, so therefore, that, that it's reasonable to speak of an average challenge situation at the game of chess. Add to say this in red, okay, having multiple depths, depth dependent values complicates this enormously. Okay, all right, so because <laughs> then you have profiles of moves with how the values change across time, not just how the values of the different moves relate to each other. Okay. So there's the uh, multiple dimension uh, situation. And actually, because, I'm, uh, because of the time, I'm not even going to get into the dimension here of how this breaks down theta breaks down into components. Okay. But I will say what I said before that this is in my model S is positional skill C is tactical consistency, and H, well, gullibility, or depth of thinking. Okay. So we'll visit that. Okay. So now I have time and room to give you one concrete thing to think about. Okay, so now so we've got a model and the blue and the red has greatly complicated the simple two-dimensional picture of the green that we had from item the basic item response theory. So now we want to design a model. Okay? And to design the model, we have to prefer some of the dimensions or some of the combinations of dimensions over the others. So in particular, what we want to do is get the probabilities of the moves. So there are two ways we could go about it. <coughs> so one of the dimension ways we can go about it, and this is what I'm now maybe being led to out of desperation, is we want the probabilities of each move. So once we have the item characteristic curve for the given response, so for the best move, it's a logistic curve. Great. We know the equation of a logistic curve uh, based on the characteristics of the, of the item. And that gives us our, OK, so the probability P of M1, well, with Z, of course, factored in, because I'm saying that our player um, parameters are 
going to be on this axis, so it's maybe multiple component axis, but we'll just think of ELO rating and uh, so ELO rating all boiling down to that. Okay, so now once we have that and we have moved, then it's our curve as a function of E. Okay. Short and sweet. Well, if we want for the other moves, so probability of MI okay, another or MJ I'm right, using another legal moves using this curve equals another curve. So curve one, let's say, or curve J. Uh, and again if as a function of the of the ELO. So if we know what curve J is, we could go that route. Okay. But as I started off by saying, even IRT people don't have a fix on what the mathematical functions of those other curves should be. So in my model, I went a different route. Okay. So instead of taking this dimension and trying to replicate this picture, I instead asserted that there should be a natural law governing the relationship of the probabilities of the moves. So if I were to follow IRT, I would put the IRT curve idea first, and then for each rank or each, or each value, then figure out the curve and apply it. Instead, I put the idea of the probability first even before we start applying the parameters of the model. So it's a different precedence that I gave. Okay. So I chose to legislate to legislate, which means theorize that the probabilities okay um, that for any fixed z of mj, okay, I'm sorry, that the pj equals the probabilities, and now let me just say that I do this in green because I'm fixing z, and I mean the probability of mj given the values. Obey an exponential decay law. Okay. The probability that PJ equals P one raised to the power power of some function G of the value of Vj, okay, and this is with z fixed, okay, and actually no dependence on other values, so actually I realize I probably shouldn't read this in So, so only V1 and not the other values okay. and the dependence on other values, so the other values reflected in the fact that the sum from j equals 1 to L, pj equals 1, as used to fit p1. Okay. So 
So what my model does is it um, asserts that the probabilities of the other moves obey a relationship like this where the um, where it's the probability of the best move, whatever the shape of the position. So in fact, let me note this. Say, uh, right in black, whatever the shape <coughs> or profile of the move. Or of the moves of the positions. So this is the idea of the main equation in my model. And when you write that as an equation, if you take the logarithms of both sides, okay, and um, so what you get from this is that this is the same thing as the logarithm and I actually also like inverting the log. I don't. I don't like writing logs of. I like. Uh, don't like writing logs with negative values. So what this comes out to is that the log of one over um, p one divided by the log of one over p j. is equal to this function g. Okay. Well, actually, it's, I'll put a g prime, because the function g prime is going to be inverted. So g prime is 1 over g. Is a function g of the values of the, of the, of the, where are always making me a pen? So it's a function of z, which means s, c, and h alone, and just the difference, the scale difference, in the value of the move relating to v1. So that's it. In fact, I already used the term delta j for, delta j for it. So that's. So that assertion is what explains the derivation of the model's main equation. Now in my paper, I describe this in a different way. And then my paper explains how, when I give this equation, I then, it then goes on to describe the fitting process that this implies. And the main uh, parameter to the fitting process, the main choice in my model, is okay. Um, okay. Then the question is uh, so the inside question which function G works best? Really a family of functions. But you can already tell something about this. So g prime, g prime of 0 equals 1. Why is that? Because if j is 1, then the left-hand side is 1, and the delta is 0. Okay, so g prime of 0 equals 1, um, and g prime of blunder goes to 0. We want the probability of a blunder um, to be really small. Then g prime had better go to zero. G, which is one over g prime, let me just put this: g equals one over g prime. That will make g very large, and a probability p one raised to a large power is going to hit zero pretty rapidly. Okay. <coughs> so this is 
the assumption that I've been living with, and it worked really well from, 19, uh, from, from 2011 to 2015 or so, but um, the complication over here caused by the red, the using of different values of depths and issues that I'm going to show you next week have, have sapped my confidence. So this is a theory strong, it's a headstrong scientific assertion. In other words, I am a believer in natural laws. I spoke in electrical terms the other day about the dependence of moves falling off exponentially the further apart the moves are in the game. And here I'm asserting belief in a similar exponential decay law, thinking of it as an engineer, as a mathematician. I thought this up before I gathered my data. Okay, so this is a theory-laden approach. The other approach, though, the approach that you're being taught in your other courses, is to let the data be the guide, to try to derive theory directly from greater encounter with the data. So next week, I'm going to take the view that that's what I'm going to try to promote. But my in the mean middle view is that maybe I need more interaction with IRT theory. This principle is stepping completely in front of IRT, and maybe it needs to be revised. OK, any question? I did not give out any more paper, and uh, there is an attendance sheet going around. Now, now read the paper that I gave you.